Welcome back to Business Week. I'm joined now by board director and technology expert, Juliet Ehimwen, CEO of Beyond Limits and former West Africa director for Google, where she spent a remarkable 12 years. So we're starting with U.S. and chip makers. Mm -hmm. This further clamp down. Does the U.S. actually just want to obliterate <laughs> Chinese participation in the tech sector? What's your take on, on this? You know, I think one can see strategy okay. uh, around the wave of competition, especially in the space of AI between the U.S. and China. And, you know, this started last year. Last year, the U.S. Um, issued some restrictions preventing the export of um, some advanced AI semiconductor chips to China. Right. And NVIDIA, one of the largest manufacturers, had two very advanced uh, chip products that were you know, increasingly seen as the industry standard when you think about building chatbots, uh, chatbots or other AI applications. Mm. And the sales of the, these chips were affected by the restrictions. But they found a workaround <laughs> and, uh, you know, based on that, developed another chip uh, uh, labeled the H800, mm. right? Um, and the workarounds were around performance and speed. And um, they were able to ship those legally. So what the U.S. government is trying to do now is to curb those um, gaps by updating the restrictions. And so they're going to, uh, you know, this week uh, issue some updates. Um, Chips that fall under the existing parameters will obviously mm. not be able to be exported, but others would be subject to review as well. And, um, you know, a number of uh, considerations yeah. to just make sure that, um, you know, from the U.S. perspective, the narrative is uh, ensuring that they're not used for um, applications that harm national security. Yeah. But I mean, this, this would have implications for those U.S. firms that do ma manufacture these chips, right? Do they have alternative export markets? They do, but China is the largest mm. uh, market for these exports. So it's likely, it, definitely there'll be an impact, impact on market valuation, impact on, on sales and revenue. And I think we're likely to see two things as mm. a result of this. One is that these organizations are likely to be in negotiations with the U.S. government, mm. lobbying for, you know, perhaps tax incentives and other relief to just really help cushion the effect mm. of, uh, of these restrictions. The second, which is uh, more long-term and from a China perspective, it's very likely that we would see the emergence of new tech companies manufacturing chips from China okay. that rival the uh, chips that are pr uh, manufactured in the U.S. So, you know, in, the, in a five to ten year time frame, mm. it's, uh, you know, it's very likely that we'll see that emerge because yeah, very... they have to respond mm. and uh, ensure that there's sus some sustainability and a long term plan around around this. Yeah, very interesting as we talk about China. Now, the second story is that Google is planning to manufacture its flagship Pixel 8. I know you'll be very interested <laughs> in this one. In India, right. which is seen as a potential rival of base, a manufacturing hub and base to, to China. Yes. What do you make of this? I mean, this is great news for India that yes. it's, it's now firmly a, a preferred or a, a preferred location for supply chain uh, uh, um, inputs. Absolutely. And, you know, there are a number of things to unpack here. So, um, you know, focusing on India, just like we were talking about, um, we're seeing a lot more tech giants reducing the dependence of their supply chains on China. Mm. And, you know, Apple released its latest iPhone last month. A lot of the units making up that phone were produced in India. Samsung has its largest mobile phone factory yeah. operating in India. It um, ships 120 million units every year. Foxcom, which is an, uh, one of the largest uh, electronics manufacturers from Taiwan, uh, has one of, uh, has, is investing increasingly, has just bought a huge uh, plot of land to build out factory on the outskirts of New Delhi. So, you know, we're seeing a lot of examples of, mm. you know, businesses uh, favoring India as a hub for manufacturing. And the Indian government has leaned into this and is encouraging it. So there's a Make in India um, initiative, right? Um, and that's providing financial incentives, providing ease of doing business in different ways mm -hmm. to just really attract these uh, uh, global giants to invest in manufacturing in India. And, you know, since that initiative started, uh, the production and export of electronic devices has really gone up. So, mm -hmm. you know, mobile phones, for example, in the past year, 
uh, the exports of um, mobile phones have doubled to about $8.5 billion. From India? From India. Wow. Okay. And, and the country has a goal to, um, to, to raise that game to uh, $300 billion dollars in 2025 to 2026. So you can see a lot of seriousness, mm. you know, and very great strategic thinking there. Yeah. And I think that's, a, that's an important lesson for Nigeria as mm. well, because, you know, this is, you know, when companies are looking at where to house their businesses, they're not that bothered about location in and of itself, mm. but they consider three things. One is, what, what's the business operating environment? Right. You know, is it enabling? Do you have a lot of labor, skilled mm -hmm. labor? Is it cheap, right? right? Can we operate in a cost-effective and sustainable way in this environment? And when you look at Nigeria in comparison to India, mm. we've got labor, mm -hmm. it's skilled, yes. it's cheap, right? And, you know, so, we, we, you know, big tick on two out of those three items. We have some work to do around, you know, making sure that the environment is enabling and creating a perception as well out there that, yes, it, we're open for business. You can invest, you know, successfully, sustainably, profitably mm. in this environment. And I think that's something that um, is very important for the government to double down on very deliberately, you know, re reaching out to these uh, um, uh, global giants and, you know, getting in conversation, creating the incentives, and let's get a few quick wins because, yeah. you know, once you have one or two big uh, examples, others will follow, mm. right? But it just signals the opportunity that exists on the table. And then, you know, the, the, the last thing to say about this, um, you know, I, I often get asked the question about, you know, why companies like Google, for example, would invest in devices, right? You know, Google that is uh, for all like the actual purposes. smartphone. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Mm. Um, and we're seeing a lot more, uh, you know, a lot of hyperscalers investing in access in different ways. When you think about Internet access, for you to be able to um, get advantage, take advantage of all the plethora of tools and services. The starting point is access. Yeah. You need so you to need a device. Access. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, a data and a device, mm -hmm. right? And so, you know, uh, Google has intervened in different ways to try to bring down the costs of smartphones and to make sure that, you know, the user experience, right, in using those uh, devices um, is, is catered for and, um, you know, users are able to get a relatively great quality smartphone at a more affo affordable rate. Mm -hmm. I remember um, when I was a director for Google in uh, West Africa, what, during the early years, we launched uh, Android One, which was a lower cost smartphone in partnership with an OEM. That year we partnered with um, Transion, uh, manufacturers of mm -hmm. um, Techno and uh, Inf Infinix devices. And we also partnered with MTN on a data, from a data bundle perspective. And the intention was just really to make sure that there was a and, great And what experience. was the uptake like for, for that phone? Yes. So um, as the prices come down, mm -hmm. we see a lot more uh, uptake. And um, there's uh, the prices on a year-on-year -year basis. We've okay. seen a drop in prices. There's still, when you think about the average income of, um, you know, of the person on the street, there's still scope for, you know, um, for the smart price, devices yeah. to have uh, for the mm. price reductions. And so, Absolutely. but yes, we did see a, a, an uptake. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's that's really interesting because we talk about financial inclusion. It's it's almost like these days your your phone or your device is almost like currency. Absolutely. Without it, you can't trade. There's the e-commerce, which we'll be talking about now. So exactly. it's, it would be really good to see more of these things manufactured for bottom of the pyramid and low income consumers. And, and particularly what you said about ways to attract people to host their supply chain operations uh, in a market like this. Yes, I think that's a huge opportunity area that we need to be deliberate about. Mm. Hopefully the Minister for Digital Economy and, and some of the others are listening. So International Day for Poverty was on Tuesday. Mm. And, you know, when we look at Nigeria's statistics, it's, it's very sobering. Um, and some of these things we're even talking about yeah. in terms of locating large-scale industry and manufacturing will go a long way to helping us uh, improve people's livelihoods and obviously eradicate poverty. What are some of the big messages we, yeah. we should know now in this celebration of International Poverty Day? It, it almost sounds very grim to be celebrating exactly. it. Exactly, I know. I, but I, I think, think it's, it's meant to shed a light. It's more of a reflection. It's more of a reflection, yes. right. Yeah. It's more of a reflection. So what are some of the big data we should be aware of? And, and you know, how far are we from reaching that goal or that nirvana? We're not very far. We haven't made uh, as much progress as we'd like. 
We've been talking about eradication of poverty for you know, multiple decades now. We're not there yet, mm -hmm. and little progress has been made in the grand mm -hmm. scheme of things. And it's important to reflect on this because we're talking about real people, real lives Absolutely. Right, that are impacted. Um, there was a research uh, recently by the National Bureau of Statistics uh, in partnership with UNICEF, UNDP, and a number of organizations just looking at uh, the multidimensional poverty index. Basically, mm -hmm. you know, multidimensional poverty index measures three uh, factors that um, can be used to establish the level of poverty, right, mm -hmm. from a holistic perspective. One is, um, you know, monetary value. The second is education. And the third is access to basic in infrastructural services. Mm. And this survey was conducted with about 56,000 households in Nigeria. The results show that 63% of Nigerians are multidimensionally poor. Wow. Mm. So that's a very, that's a staggering reality. Mm. And um, what I would say, though, in terms of, um, you know, looking forward and what needs to happen, I, I, you know, I think the digital economy has a very big role to play in our objectives around eradicating poverty and creating opportunity mm. for people at scale. And, you know, it's great to, to, to see the strategic blueprint mm. that has just been released by the Ministry of Comms, Innovation and the Digital Economy. Yeah. I think the blueprint really touches on the key areas that need to be solved for when you think about you know, skills development, when you think about job creation. So it's great to see that, and I think it, uh, it focuses on the right mm. things. Um, what I would just double down on around that is access to jobs, training people at scale, but also looking at access to jobs. And you know, one area that we haven't really made a lot of progress around is business process outsourcing. Okay. And that links back to what we were just saying so about, about India. India. Yeah, exactly. absolutely. You know, uh, that was from the context of manufacturing, but even with services, right? It, and, and the parameters are the same. You're looking for ch uh, cheap labor. You're looking for skilled labor. Cheap labor, but not English. exploited labor. That's important. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Not exploited, exactly. The, mm. right, the right price. Mm. Um, and, you know, we, we, we have language on our side. In many ways, we actually have the time zone mm. on our side Absolutely. as well. So it just feels like we're leaving money on the table mm. by not going after this. Um, a, a recent Bloomberg report estimated the global out, uh, business process outsourcing industry at um, over $200 billion. Wow, yeah. So that's a huge- That's a huge that's a share huge to tap market. into, yeah. And, you know, it's, it requires very deliberate efforts around- Indeed. You know, safety, security, uh, the narrative out there. And I, I would say even one-on-one, -on -one, you know, conversations with, uh, you know, key players globally mm. and inviting them, creating almost like a bubble for them to operate in while we're sorting Figuring out, out other all things. the other things. Yes, you yeah. know, we have to be you have to start from somewhere. We have to be deliberate mm. to move this needle. If we're looking at eradicating poverty, you know, yeah, maybe in the next few years, if, if we get this right, we may not have eradicated poverty completely, but we would have shifted the curve, would Absolutely. have moved the needle, mm. right? Because yeah. these, these tools mm. you know, just really make a difference. And if you're able to create jobs for 3 million people, there's a ripple effect on their families. Absolutely, you know? Absolutely. And so there's a yeah. opportunity. I, I mean, so very well said. There's so much we could explore. But I want us to touch on this last story, which is that South Africa is going to overtake Nigeria as the largest economy in Africa. In my mind, yeah. as a Nigerian, yeah. um, as a follower, economist, observer of markets, mm -hmm. I'm thinking, what is the big deal, really? So can someone tell me why <laughs> this is even a big deal? If we're moving the needle on reform and we're doing all the things we should be doing, should we be worried about who's number one and who's number two? We should certainly keep our focus on moving the needle, growing yeah. the economy. Mm -hmm. On the ground, there's no big deal, right? right? Because it's not like something has drastically changed in our economy. But when you think about the fact that in the last year, the Naira to the dollar has lost its value, about 40 to 60% of its value, mm. right? You know, our GDP is calculated in Naira mm. right? and, and generated in Naira. When you convert that to dollars, of it's course, a the value has value. gone down. Even though we're doing the same production, okay. right? The value goes down when you do that conversion. So that's why we're having these numbers, right? And... There's something to be said for reputational capital. Okay, <laughs> explain. It probably doesn't affect the you know, so the that we can the street, but, raise you know, shoulders. <laughs> well, you know, it, it, it's um, you know, it, it, it's nice to be able to say we are the largest economy in Africa. Okay, right. In real terms, like for I said, who? For investors no, or people who are trying? For investors, investors, yeah. and I have been part of that narrative, mm, right? Of course, in championing Nigeria as you know a a, a worthy 
uh, destination for investment and, and in trying to attract great projects to the country. I have been part of that narrative. Oh, it's the, it's the largest economy in, in Africa. It has the you know, highest, uh, largest population. It's this, it's that. Mm. So those are metrics that are useful for that type of work. Okay. But in Makes real sense. terms, in terms of on the ground reality, let's just focus on growing the economy, Absolutely. diversifying the economy. And in that way, we will be able to, you know, um, yeah. Women in. Now, now I get it. And, and very well said. I do think we, we need to do a better job of selling and marketing in Nigeria in a positive yes, yes, light. Thank absolutely. you. Thank you so much, Julia Ehumwan, CEO of Beyond Limits. Great to have you always <laughs> offer your expert insights.